Hey folks, Kiltman here. Kiltman out. Your gothic services. How are you all? Hope you're all doing very, very well. Now you may notice my voice is still a little bit croaky because I've still got a COVID cough. Although I think I'm pretty much, I think I've seen the back of the COVID cloud. I think, I think I've passed through to the other side. So anyway, folks, before we go any further, <clears throat> a big shout out to my good friend Cristiano, who popped his head round the door of the cask pub where I was languishing in the corner, in the plague ridden corner, with whiskies and plenty. And he popped his head round the door. Guilty! Look what I got for ya! I don't know why I gave him a Cockney accent. He hasn't got a Cockney accent, he's pure scouts. But he passed in a copy of The Mutations from, I think, 1974. Donald Pleasance and some pesky, weird experiments about the next step of mankind's evolution. He's combining men with plants and coming up with rather monstrous beasties. Lots of sleazy bits of nudity as well. And, uh, and Tom Baker as a deformed freak with a great big floppy hat, a great big long coat and a big scarf. It was the proto costume for what would become Doctor Who. Yeah. So, I'm gonna look at that. Cristiano mate, brilliant. Uh, good old 70s, sleazy British, ripe weirdness. We'll have a good look at that. So, anyway, thanks for that. And uh, also, thanks to the, uh, the group <coughs> who have been trying to track me down. <laughs> Again, everything's related to pubs with me, isn't it? And in a different pub, not the cask, but in the Telegraph, or the telly, um, I went in the other day, and uh, even though I was coughing and wheezing, but the dog dragged me in there. You've had too much fresh air there, Dad. Come on, now get some whiskey down your neck. And everyone was telling me that, oh, there's been some people looking for you. Uh-oh. <laughs> really? <laughs> uh, no, they're only young, but they're, they're, they're fans of yours. Fans. <laughs> so, I don't know who these people are. No names were given. But there was a little note which someone else passed to me because they said, oh yeah, there was a group in here looking for you. Uh, they they want to meet you. All right, okay. And there's a little note to Kiltman. We'd like to meet, arrange a meeting with you. And there's a mobile number. I said, was it this a, this a bloke? No, it was a girl. <laughs> of course it was a girl. I knew that all along. Only girls need their numbers for me. Um, so yeah, I, well, we'll work something else anyway. If only just to find out who these mystery people are, what they really want. So, anyway, now to the meat of the matter. A video which I meant to do in time for Halloween, which has just gone, but I was too ill to do it. So now, because it's, it's, in my, it's running through my veins, like the lifeblood a vampire craves. Yes, it's Hammer's 1968 classic, Dracula has risen from the grave. I love this movie. It's not one of the, uh, the greatest of Dracula movies, but then again, there's not that many Hammer Draculas that are actually any good. I mean, I'd say the first three, which is Dracula, or in America, Horror of Dracula, and then Dracula, Prince of Darkness, which, pre which is the one that comes just before this one, Dracula Risen from the Grave. Then you get Taste of the Blood of Dracula. Then you get Scars of Dracula. Then you get... Hang on, what is it? Dracula AD 1972, which I think I have covered. And then you get Satanic Rites of Dracula. So the seven Christopher Lee Dracula movies and the seven proper Frankenstein movies for Hammer. Now, the Frankenstein movies, as I've always said, barring one horrific misstep, which is the horror of Frankenstein with Ralph Bates and Dave Prowse in a nappy, um, they are singularly better. It's a better franchise, it's a better series. And there's more imagination and flair in pretty much all of those movies than in the vast majority of Dracula movies. And you can pretty much see why Christopher Lee returning as Dracula for the third time in this outing was getting increasingly um, ratty and pissed off with the whole thing because he's given nothing to do. It's a, it's a really wretched formula, which this film doesn't do a great deal to really alter the template. He's resurrected, he has a couple of nights of reign of terror, and then he's pursued, he's got a girl with him, he's, he's, he's held sway over somebody, and then the hero gets up there, and finally there's a big scare, big battle, and Dracula is vanquished yet again. You know, it, it's just, he must be so desperate. Wow, I'm awake, quick, 
Quick, get me some man to feed on. Right, get me some slave. Let me do something quickly before I get impaled again or turned to ash. Come on, quickly, I haven't got much time. Because he knows. His, his nights are numbered, aren't they? Anyway, so 1968 sees Dracula has risen from the grave. A sort of a follow-on from the Dracula Prince of Darkness, where he ends up frozen in his own moat. Not quite the same in this, but anyway, we'll come on to it. And this is directed by Freddie Francis, uh, the Oscar-winning um, cinematographer. Oscar-winning for Glory and the Sons of Daughters. But he also did The Innocence for Jack Clayton. Oh my God, one of my favourite films of all time. And he pioneered the use of coloured gels. Even though that was a CinemaScope movie, but filmed in black and white, his use of gels on the, on the camera work gave sort of abstract, sort of surreal edges to the frame, the big widescreen frame. And so things you couldn't quite see in the periphery. And this would be brought into the Hammer movies as well. He was working with a guy called Arthur Grant at the time he did The Innocents. And Arthur Grant does the cinematography for this movie. But of course, he's working for a director who is a Oscar-winning cinematographer himself. And Arthur Grant was saying to him, you know, the, the, those gels you used on uh, The Innocents, I wouldn't mind, you know, experimenting with those. So in this movie, you get one of the most beautiful of Hammer's Dracula movies because, and it's in full Eastman colour and all that, but you've got these coloured gels. Throughout most of it, there'll be orange or green, sickly, eerie glows that they, they transfigure the screen into. And then as it goes on and Dracula becomes more prevalent, red, rich red sort of glowing textures. It's wonderful. And the cinematography is excellent, as I say. But Freddie Francis had migrated from sitting behind the camera to sitting in the director's chair. And he'd done, he's done a lot of movies and a lot of horror. And he'd done the likes of um, Dr. Terror's House of Horrors, or Dr. Horror's House of Terrors, however you look at it. Um, the Skull for Amicus, Torture Garden, uh, Tales of Witness Madness, the anthology portmanteau movies. He would work for Tyburn as well, with The Ghoul and Legend of the Werewolf. Uh, and he would go on to the big, big blockbusters too, like Glory, like uh, Scorsese's Cape Fear, The French Lieutenant's Woman. You know, he, magnificent. Uh, but his own directorial stuff, I think his final movie, that he directed was The Doctor and the Devils. I think that was it. He did TV stuff as well, but he did a lot of stuff, including Trog, that unfortunate bloody uh, caveman movie. Dear, dear. Haven't seen that in donkey's years, and don't really think I need to see it again, to be honest. Cheers, Joel. It's just tea. The house is alcohol-free at the moment. And I'm supposed to be feeling better, you know. So anyway... The script is by John Elder. That's not John Elder, we know that. It's Anthony Hines, a producer and screenwriter for Hammer Movies, under the pseudonym John Elder. I like the name John Elder, actually, but anyway, that's not his real name. And the story is, it's, it will be open, really, with um, the young bell ringer legging it to the church in the, t in the little village in the lee of Castle Dracula, up on the hill, the mountain. And uh, as he goes in to ring the bell, there's blood cursing down the rope. Ah, that's, that's not usual, is it? And in it, although the sets are really good, uh, Bernard Robinson again had done the, uh, the art production uh, and set design, and most of it's lovely. Uh, it's got this lovely church of stained glass windows and this strange sort of uh, green velvet studded doors. Hmm, green and sort of, or leather studded. Very strange looking thing, like some kind of uh, opulent sort of debauched dungeon, more than a church. Anyway, there's also a metal spiral staircase, kind of reminiscent of what you see in the original haunting. And uh, he runs up there because there's clearly something wrong with this bell. It doesn't normally bleed when, it, when, he, when he yanks its chain. And as he goes up there to music, not dissimilar from this, because this is the score from uh, James Bernard. Come on to that again later. And as he has a look under the bell, whoa! No, he runs, sorry, he, he runs screaming from the um, the church. But he runs into the priest, Ewan Hooper, I think, I think his name is. Let me check that. Ewan Hooper, indeed. Comes running in, like, what, what, what happened, boy? What happened? And he's going, because uh, 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 he's lost his voice now. Whatever he saw within that great big bell, 
go make up your own stories, uh, has struck him dumb. So the priest goes in, up the rickety spiral metal staircase, which really doesn't belong in a church, you know, and looks under and up, upside down, cascades this woman, oh, this poor woman, uh, Giselle, her name, it transpires, her name is, with puncture wounds there and blood dripping everywhere. And if you look rather unpleasantly, because she's hanging upside down, mighty hammer cleavage, but she hasn't really properly shaved her armpits. Hmm, I'm not sure what's more unpleasant, to be honest. The cascading blood, the rather obvious big, you know, appliance neck bites, or the hairy armpits. But anyway, anyway, that was a year prior. So that, they, these, that what you just saw there was kind of the events which are happening around the time of Dracula, Prince of Darkness. For then, we move ahead a year in time. And we meet the Monsignor. Yeah, Monsignor from out of town, from the bigger province of, Cl what's it, Kleinenberg, Kleinenberg, yeah, that's it. And uh, he's played by the great Rupert Davis, who had just finished a, a very successful run as Maygray, the detective Maygray. And he's there with his, his horse and carriage, just gently nudging the horses on, little feather-like little whips. A far cry of what you'll see later on. And certain other people are whipping the hell out of these horses. But, and he's up. It's like Gandalf coming down to the Shire, you know, and it's everything's pleasant. And he will get to the church, which we've just seen, but it's a year later now. And uh, he goes and expect to see his priest. The priest ain't there. Where's the priest? He's in the pub, isn't he? He's in the local tavern. Because he's, he's, he's had it, really. He's turned to the bottle. Glug, 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 glug. Still have the fear of Dracula and all that, even though he's meant to be dead. But the Monsignor will encounter yeah, the bell ringer, who will be now, even though he's been struck dumb, he's now got a, a bit of bit of facial putty that's been applied, and he's been very grey. Well, not, it's not even grey. It's more like sort of this sort of pale coffee colour that he's gone. Very strange. Meant to signify that you know, he's been traumatised by what he found in the giant bell. And, uh, oh, boy, where, where's your priest? He should be here saying mass. Where's your priest? Uh, 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 uh. Oh, boy. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> you can't speak. Well, you can show me, though, can't you? So, <laughs> poor lad, poor bell ringer, has to drag the Monsignor to the pub, <laughs> where the priest is there. Why aren't you doing your service, your mass? I've given, I've given mass already. But there was nobody there. No, there was nobody there. No one comes to the church anymore. Why? Why? Is, what? The Monsignor is actually a lovely guy, but he just can't fathom this. What's going on? And you've got the uh, the pub landlord, who is um, oh, played by George Cooper, I think his name is. You recognise him. He's in tons of movies and tons of TV shows. Normally playing a pub landlord. And uh, what? Not Michael Ripper, you say? Hold your horses. Michael Ripper's going to be in this. Don't you worry about that. Coming up shortly. And, uh, but, you know, the, the fear of, the, of Dracula. Dracula was destroyed 12 months ago. You know, he, he, the evil has gone. No, no, it's not that, though, sir. Not that, Monsignor. The shadow of his castle, well, it, it touches the church. What? The shadow of the, of the castle up on the mountain, it, it touches the church. People are afraid to go in there. But he's dead. They're going around in circles. He's dead, he's dead. No, wait, no but the shadow... Ooh. Right, I want to speak to my priest alone. You, father, we've got some business to do. Right, you know, but I'm afraid. Well, you won't be. I'll be with you. We're going to meet just before dawn. So 5.30 tomorrow morning. I want you to meet me at the church because we're going up to that castle. What? I'm not going up there. Y yes, you are. <laughs> oh, you are. And what, they, what their plan is, what the Monsignor's plan is, to put, the, put to rest this evil and it, the way it's permeated the village forevermore. They go into the church and he picks up the great big bloody golden crucifix. Think um, Father Malone in the fog giving back that huge gold bullion melted down into a big crucifix back to the, uh, the nautical, marauding, mutilated leper ghost that is Captain Blake. Think one of them. And it, it's a, it's, I, I love this imagery. Because he puts this bloody cross on his back. We all got our cross to bear, haven't we? Straps it to, and off they go. And it's not—it's not hard to find Castle Dracula. 
Although a lot of people keep seeing something, just, just show me where it is. I don't know where, take me there, take me there. When apparently if it's shadow on the mountain touches the church, surely stand by the church and look up and you'll see the bloody castle. But no one seems to think of that like. So they've got to go through, um, oh, what's it called? Box Hill, is it Box Hill? Yeah, and Black Park. It's all filmed at Pinewood Studios. And a lot of the of Dracula Prince of Darkness was filmed in Black Park. So you see, you'll see, you see that park a lot. And Box Hill in Dorking as well. And uh, so you, what you've, got to, you've got to go through the forest, meet, go to the crossroads in Black Park, and then turn left and, until you get to the polystyrene rocks. And then you scramble at the polystyrene rocks. And then you just look up, go around the bend, look up, and you'll see a lovely glass-painted matte, matte background of a Carpathian mountain <laughs> with Castle Dracula sitting on top of it. Not hard to find, really. So they get up there anyway, and the, the priest himself is getting a bit jittery. For, uh, Monsignor, I, I can't go on. I can't go on. But you must, you must go on. And then in a, in a moment of benevolence, because the Monsignor is a lovely bloke, really. He just goes, all right then, don't you worry. You rest here. I'll go on. Wait here for me. <laughs> so he goes up there, and basically what he's going to do... The cat... The villagers haven't destroyed the castle even after the, the end of Dracula's Reign of Terror in Prince of Darkness. They haven't. They've neglected to do that. But it's still, it's still there. It's a great big edifice. And whenever you see it, you're, you're looking up at it and it's sort of like, it's sort of going up the way the angle is with all nightmarishly, you know, turbulent skies. And it looks wonderful, actually. And it makes you long to see inside this castle. However, you won't. Don't get your hopes up. You will not get one glimpse inside the doors of that castle which are barred and chained, and the Monsignor gets this big crucifix, and he rams it down after these chains, so it's barring the way. Look, and then he sanctifies the, the castle, reads a prayer, thunder and lightning, the priest further down is like, and of course, he's got a little flask, glug, 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 glug. but he stumbles and falls and bangs his head, douche on the polystyrene rocks can be quite treacherous, can't they? And results in quite a, a ketchup stain on, on your fod. Boof! Like that. And the blood, bright red, trickles down the polystyrene and then drips onto a, a, a rather obvious glass covering, which is meant to be ice. It's not frozen, so why is... Dr yes, Dracky Pants is in there. Poor old Christopher Lee. Oh, God. Here we go again. Ugh. But the, the ice has broken and the blood drips in. And the blood drips... Where's it drip? Where's it drip? Straight into his mouth. Yeah, what are the chances of that? What are the chances of that happening? Well, in a Hammer horror movie, exceptionally good or exceptionally bad. And uh, so he's revived. And they break, they break the rules a lot in this movie, to be honest. I don't mind it. And I know I can, I sound like, I know I can sound like I'm, I'm taking the piss out of this movie. And I am, but I'm doing it with reverence as well, because I do love this movie. And it's because I love it that much that you can, you can actually have a lot, a lot of fun with it and you can take the piss. A lot of the Dracula movies, you take the piss out of them because they're wretchedly bad. This has its heart on its sleeve and it's, I like the characters, I like the story, I like the setting, I like the atmosphere. So even when it, it throws a, a few wobblers, like the polystyrene rock, <laughs> they're not that bad actually, you've seen far worse. Um, but they break, it breaks a few vampiric rules and a lot of fans did not like it for this reason. But anyway, so the priest wakes up, like, and it, the blood stain's gone from his head. There's just a little tiny bit around it, but there's a great big massive welter of gore on his fod. And he sees, because now the uh, the ice is it's now proper water, and he sees a shimmering reflection. Yes, reflection of Dracula, who's on a little outcropping of rocks just over there. And he's going, you, you, keep still, you, you, whatever you are. Uh, reflection. Is it like when Doctor Who regenerates? So each new resurrection, does Dracula get or regain something that he didn't have previously? So suddenly now he's got a reflection. And in this you'll find he can do something else as well. Although what will come in very handy throughout a lot of this movie is to change into a bat, which he seems to have forgotten how to do that. So anyway, so he now has the priest in his thrall and Monsignor comes down he's done his, his exorcism and all that his, his, the mass he's read out in Latin storm clouds and lightning has been everywhere he comes down can't find the priest 
So he goes back to the tavern you know, as, the, as, the, as the priest come back. And this is a curious moment. That landlord, clearly lying, says, uh, oh, yes, yes, he came, he came back before. He, he, he's got business to attend to. Oh, well, okay. Well, anyway, the evil is gone now. I've blessed that castle and I put a big golden crucifix up there. Nothing evil is going to come out of that. Probably very true because there's nothing actually evil in there. The evil's already outside and, uh, and can't get in. So Monsignor flutters off back to uh, Kleinenberg, Kleinensteinenberg, whatever the hell it is, and uh, on his little horse and cart, pleasantly through the meadows of Black Park and Box Hill. And, uh, but in the meantime, Dracula's got the priest now. And uh, they go up to the back of the battlements, and there's the, there's the doors barred by this great big crucifix. And Dr <laughs> poor old Christopher Lee is like, Remove that! Who did that? <laughs> and like, remove it at once, you know. And he, he tells him it was the Monsignor. The Monsignor, yes, from Kleinenberg. Mm. He has a daughter. No, he doesn't. He has a niece. <laughs> a niece, you say? Mm. You're coming with me. I will have my revenge on the Monsignor. Or oh, words to that effect. And that's the plan, that's the plot. Dracula with this priest, whose name we never get to know. And the, he's, a, he's a great actor as well. Ewan Hooper plays him. and uh, But sadly, he's dubbed over by someone else's voice. And now the reason why this happened, excuse me, isn't because his voice was terrible. After the film wrapped, they, they wanted to bring people back in to, to obviously do their voices again, to overdub the voices. But he wasn't not available. So they, behind his back, they brought in someone else. I mean, they had to do something, I suppose. And to be honest, the voice isn't that bad. You know, it's 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 not his. And you can see there's some kind of lip sync issues there. But it's, it's no real detriment to it. The guy playing the priest, the way he looks in this movie, if you cast your mind back to uh, Don Coscarelli's epic, awesome phantasm, do you remember the priest that gets the, uh, the, silver, the silver sphere and it drills into his head? He looks just like him. <laughs> and there's another priest who's also a little bit on the air, uh, on the dark side of things. Can't be trusted. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, he's now working with Dracula. So these two. And <laughs> you've got Dracula now. And they're going, I need a coffin. So remember that girl that was hanging in the uh, the big bell, in the bell tower? Carrie, her name was actually Carrie Baker. And she plays Giselle. Giselle for Belle. And um, they dig up her grave. Now, we only, this isn't part of the story. It's just, it's got Giselle written on it. And the girl, Carol Baker, plays Carol Baker, Carrie Baker, who plays Giselle, the Bell Tower girl, also plays the corpse that rolls out of this coffin when the poor priest digs it up. And they've got a hearse there. And they slam that in there. Because obviously, Dracky Pants needs, a, needs somewhere to put his head down, doesn't he? You know, during the, the daylight hours. So... There you go. They're off to Kleinenberg now, and uh, the vengeance in mind. So let's go to Kleinenberg then, and let's meet our major two protagonists, and that would be Paul, played by, what's his name, Barry Andrews. Now, Barry Andrews is a curly-headed, um, very sort of severely, severe pointy chin, severe angular pointy nose, pointy features. Still a good-looking guy, though. And... If you recognise him, it's because a few years later, he would be the uh, the ploughman in the fields who unearths the demonic skin, the, the the demon in the fields for Blood on Satan's Claw. And he's great in that as well. He didn't do a great deal of movies and he didn't do anything else for Hammer, to my knowledge. Did a lot of TV stuff, and uh, which is such a shame he should have done more because I, I, I think he's got, he gives a great performance here. I love the sound of his voice. And I love, I just love the hair, you know, the big curly barnet. He works in a Johan's Cafe or Cafe Johan, which has a big bakery attached to it. And it's a proper tavern as well. And it has, you know, rooms to let and all that. And he's working there. First time you see him, he's down, he's down in the, the bakery part with the, you know, the big, big ovens and he's shoving coals in there. And all these bratwursts and stuff are coming out. In fact, if you look at some of the food that they serve up, they look like sort of Transylvanian burritos. In fact, I was drooling looking at this the other night. Oh my God, I thought, the biggest, fattest burritos ever. 
awesome. So Max helps in the bakery and he also serves upstairs alongside the unbelievably sexy Xena, played by Barbara Ewing. Oh God, a lot of, a lot of breath will be spent waxing lyrical over the, the beauties and the salacious, sleazy teasiness of Barbara Ewing, Xena. Um, but who's Johan? Well, actually, no, it's not Johan. Who runs it? It's Max. Who plays Max? Michael Ripper. Da -da -da -da. With little, little round spectacles and a bit of grizzly beard on him. And uh, he's always got a cheeky little look on his face. He's always chatting to the locals. He's loving them, having a good time. But um, Paul works there. He's a student, but he's got the hots for Maria. Yes. And Maria is the Monsignor's niece. The, Mon the Monsignor has taken in his niece and her mother, his, his brother's wife. His brother has died, so he's doing the honourable thing and he's took them in. No, no hanky-panky, none of that sort of business. Um, and the niece, Maria, is played by Veronica Carlson, who was new to Hammer when she made this. But she would also go on to another couple of Hammer movies and she would also be the, the unfortunate victim of uh, Peter Cushing's rape uh, as Baron Frankenstein. Frankenstein rapes her in the very mean-spirited Frankenstein must be destroyed a couple of years later. So, hmm. But anyway, and she's beautiful, blonde, gorgeous. And she wants to introduce Paul to her mother. The Monsignor's away at the weekend, you see, because he's gone, he's gone to a little, that little town to go and talk to the bloody priest and put crucifixes in Castle Dracula's doorway and all that kind of caper. So they've timed it well, only they haven't because he's back, isn't he? He's come back. And like, the mother, Anna, played by Marion, uh, Marion Maffey, who's great. Who's was a dead ringer for uh, one of the barmaids in the cask. Sharon Shazza, if you're watching. Looks like you. No one near as sexy, of course, like, but anyway. Cheers, y'all. Mm. So he comes back early, and it's Maria's birthday as well. So they, they invited, invited Paul over for dinner, and the priest, the Monsignor, has got a, a a lovely jeweled crucifix to give to her for her birthday. He's a very religious man. That's going to come. That's going to be really important, <laughs> as if it wasn't already. So, Paul apparently doesn't drink, although he does drink beer. But beer doesn't really count, does it? So he doesn't. He doesn't drink like spirits. He doesn't drink schnapps. He will do. He doesn't smoke cigars, and he doesn't drink you know, wine or spirits. But anyway, he's got to get on. He's all dressed up, and like Zena has got the hots for him. She, she's the barmaid there looks, and she's sensational. She, Barbara Ewing uh, was not, it's not that big. She isn't that buxom. She's actually quite small and diminutive, but with the, the typical hammer corset and the low cut, the cleavage, they force them together. And cause she spoke about this, like, you know, I don't know how hammer did it, but my God, they made me look really bosomy and, you know, buxom. And the irony is that Barbara Ewing would go on to play the wife of uh, Timothy West in the in the TV show Brass about a northern mining community set in like the turn of the century, and uh, you know where there's muck, there's brass, and all this. And she forever has a local top. It became a that was the focal point of, of the show for many reasons, but those bazoomies, which she didn't really have, so she must have grown them after you know after working on this. Anyway. She's always like, she fancies Paul, but she's like, well, always Maria, it's always Maria. You're going off to meet Maria, aren't you? And there's no real bit in the, bitterness there. It's, it's very convivial, all of this. And I, and, well, yeah, I'm in love with her. You know, anyway, anyway, you see, you've got a thousand boyfriends. And she's like, no, and all this. Like, and they're all like, they're trying to look down their top and all this. But she plays tricks on all the patrons there as well. A lot of students in there with silly little na navy hats on for some reason. Don't know. Um, but it's great. It's great. I'd love to drink there. It looks like a really boss place. So he's all dressed up to go and have this dinner. And the students are, come on, Paul, join in. And they've got this ridiculous drinking game. Hammer has a lot of this sort of stuff in a lot of their movies. And they've got like a great big, I don't know, I think it's a broom. And on the top of that is a pint or a stein with a, with a, with a full beard in it against the ceiling. And you've got to, you've got to hold that and, and dance around it whilst drinking a pint yourself. So you're doing this. Anyway, Maria comes in and she, all dressed up oh, to meet her Paul to show him off and all that back at home and um, and and, what? and her face just drops. Right, Paul and he goes Maria. Ah. 
gets doused in beer, doesn't he? We've all been there. And uh, and they're all laughing at him. And she's going, Paul, you promised. She's like, oh, oh. anyway, you still love me? Of course I do. And the two of them run off into this, the cobbled streets. And uh, and it's quite quite a big set that they, they're running down. Lots of different roads and avenues. And, you know, it, it's great. Different angles and culverts and stuff. I like it. Great big set, to be honest. And she goes, maybe the run will, will dry you off. Of course it doesn't, you know. So they arrive at the Monsignor's house and, uh, oh, do you think your mother will smell it? She goes, yeah, of course she will. Corn was in. And the mother is like, oh, nice to meet you, Paul. Oh, there's some flowers for you. Um, Frau, Fraulein, whatever, you know, Muller. So that means she's Maria Muller. <laughs> and the mother's Anna Muller. <laughs> uh, you see, she's going like, and of course the Monsignor's there and they're like, uh-oh, uh the Mon Uncle Maria, and he's all been all dressed up and all that, like, and uh, it's for this for this big do, which he didn't expect, and uh, didn't expect him to be there either. And of course, they can smell it on his on him. He says, "Look, well, he explains. Well, there was a drinking game, you see, sir, and I had to do this and drink, and and, and then they all go. <laughs> it's all very nice. It's all very twee, but things will come asunder because when they're sitting down having dinner." Uh, Monsignor, oh, Paul, so Paul, what is it you study? Oh, blah, 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 ology. <laughs> Would you like a cigar, Paul? Uh, uh, his name's Ernst. You'll hear Anna, that's the mother. I love this actress, and uh, she will say the name Ernst a hell of a lot, but she adds an extra vowel to it. It's like Freddie Francis directing a said, like, look, I want you to give it some kind of European inflection. Add another Ernst is just E R N S T. Add an A or an I in there. So she ever, she's forever going like Ernst, Ernst. <laughs> it sounds lovely actually, Ernst. But she says it a lot, Ernst. Why don't you could pull one of your cigars? Oh, certainly. Here you are, Paul. Oh, oh no, thank you, sir. Uh, I've always found the um, the smell of them makes me feel a bit sick. Well, I'll drink to that because that's a man who's honest. You don't get many of them these days. As even in the church, people don't speak their minds anymore. So, you know, what, by the way, what church do you go to? There's about 11 churches here in Kleinenberg. And uh, and you, you can see suddenly that uh, they're like, uh-oh, this is not good. Because, well, I, I don't go to church, actually, sir. You're not a Protestant, are you? No, no, no. Well, thank God for that. No, I'm an atheist, sir. <laughs> What? What? Um, Ernst, Ernst, your heart. <laughs> There's room for all sorts in this world. No, no, you bring an atheist into my house, Maria. And like, ah, oh, you see Veronica Carlson's face. It just, she just goes, because it was all going so well. And and Paul stands his ground. Look, sir, you you said you're like an honest man, and I always tell the truth. Well, you're not welcome in this house anymore. So yeah, they, they kick him out basically. Poor old bloody Paul. So Paul and like, you know, Maria's going to run after him. I'm like, Maria, no, stay here. You can, the mother's sympathetic, but it's like stay here. Oh, Ernst, you know, sorry, Ernst. I'm sorry, Maria, but you know, we can't be having this. Not, not the house. This is the house of the house of the Lord. I work with him. Paul goes back to a uh, cafe, Johan, and it's emptied out now. And he's like, but he's he's had he's had like beer or some. I think he drank something in the the party, well, the dinner party. And he goes in, but Zena's still there. And he goes, "Give me a schnapps, Zena." And he's like, "But you don't drink schnapps, Paul. Tonight I drink schnapps." And so she goes, "Whoa!" And she she's seen a chance. So he's like, he goes, "Oh, people drink this. Well, they don't like it, but you know they drink it for the effect it has on them. Well, there's no effect on me yet." I'll have another one while I'm waiting for the effect, to, the effect to take effect. But he gets drunk pretty quickly on on schnapps, so Zena sees her chance, and she, you, are you going to take me up to bed, are you, Zena? And he's he's drunk pretty. He's got a little, a little schnapps glass, and he's looking through that like a telescope, like a monocle. So she gets him up to his room, and she begins to undress him. She gives him a big fat kiss as well, like mm, I bet Marie doesn't kiss you like that. And he's he's going like. Zena, what are you doing in my bedroom? <laughs> in the meantime, Maria, 
They've got this thing you see in Kleinenberg. You can move wherever you want without touching the ground. Because you go across the rooftops, you open your bedroom windows, you go out onto the balcony, and it's got lovely tiled roofs. This, folks, is one of the reasons why I love this movie. You've got more of these matte paintings stretching out, you know, these high roofs, looking down the cobbled streets. All of a sudden, it's like the Hunchback of Notre Dame looking out over Paris. It's like um, the cabinet of Dr. Caligari sees it with his, his the somnambulist with his victim going up and down these um, amazing impressionist sort of rooftops. Or Mary's in the Rue Morgue, the big gorilla dragging victims across the rooftops. It's rooftop city. It looks great. So you've got Veronica Carlson making her way along these, these balconies and walls and balustrades and tiled roofs to his bedroom. Gets in there. Cena! <laughs> and like, Cena goes, oh, what, what are you doing? Nothing, apparently. Yeah. Yeah, well, he's had too much to drink, apparently. What? You know, yeah, he, he came back. He wasn't happy. He's been drinking schnapps. Oh, Paul. <laughs> Come on, help me get him into bed. So Zena starts to undo his fly. And, and Maria's like, Zena! That's my job. Anyway, so Zena gets booted out. Now, this is the thing. You've meant to think that up until now that Marie is very chaste and virginal. She simply is not. She may look like she is, but uh, living with the Monsignor. But she's been having it off with Paul. But the, the thing is, it, it's it's all very sweet and light and it's joyful young love. And she spends a night with him and then before dawn she creeps back to her room. And in it, there's imagery and symbolism are rife in this movie. She gets back into her bed and she has a little child's doll, which she then, you know, snuggles up to. You've just had a night of sex with your fella, and you've gone back and clutched this little innocent child's toy. Um, it's almost saying, like, look, yeah, but she's still an innocent, you know, the, she's in love, and this is this is proper love, you know. This isn't what Xenia was going to do to him. That's what she did, she and Paul did, was proper, genuine love for each other. They will be with each other for the, to the ends of time. The, the innocence is still... Um, Illustrated by a clutching this little um, doll. Of course, now, so, where's Dracula, you say? Well, Dracula, he's arrived in town as well. The priest arrives and he's like, he wants a room. <sighs> right. Well, uh, hang on, before that, uh, he's incarcerated Dracula and his coffin in another cellar. A cellar that's sort of adjacent to the cellar where they do all the baking in Cafe Johan. So Dracula's in there in his coffin with just dripping water, but lovely coloured gels on the lighting and on the camera. Looks fantastic. Looks very creepy. It's a great set, actually. And the priest has put him in there. But anyway, Zena's not happy after being snubbed. Uh, so she... Are you going home now, Zena says, Max? Yeah, I'm going home. And off she goes, traipsing through Black Park. And... Um, she gets ridden down by the priest and that carriage, two horses, and it's a hearse. It's not a carriage, it's a hearse. And uh, the two horses, and he's whipping. And it's a great bravura sequence. She's running through the woods, you know, getting snapped up by twigs and branches and falling over in the grass and over, you know, stones and things. And this carriage is weaving through the trees and it's going after her, hell for leather. Unfortunately, this is one of those films the Hammer made where they're using day for night. And it's really, really badly done. Um, two other examples, could, they pretty much all do it, but two of the major examples are Plague of the Zombies and uh, The Reptile. There's The Reptile there, having, making a guest appearance. And uh, oh, um, here is Plague of the Zombies making another guest appearance. Uh, this is pretty bad. The day for night here is really terrible. And um, it's almost like they haven't even tried. They just have not tried. It clearly is sort of late afternoon and the sun is shining, but it's, and they've slightly darkened the filter, you know. But it's, it, but don't worry about that. Anyway, she'll dive out of the way and a casual speed past, and then she gets up, dusts herself down. She's <sighs> got a little choker on as well. Oh, she, she's, Barbara Ewing is gorgeous in this. And then, but Dracula's hiding behind a tree. Puts the big mesmus there with those wretched bloody um, uh, contact lenses, which Christopher Lee hated. So a bit of continuity errors in this, because sometimes he's got the really bloodshot eyes, and then you cut the next shot, and it just 
Normal eyes, staring. Oh, quick, put the lenses back in. Shit, you know. Let's see one way. They just put one lens in. Ah, mm. He's there. And it's not just the cloak going around and then the cat, like a lap dissolve. He grabs the air to choke it off her neck and she's falling for him. And he puts the bite on. And that's it. Next morning, um, Paul comes down into the basement, into the, the cellar, and he finds there's Xena in just like a corset and stockings and suspenders. <laughs> that was nice. Morning, Xena. Did, didn't you go home last night? Which, of course, she did go home, but then the dragon put the bite on it, and she's been brought back to this place. And she's there, and she's she knows something's happened, and she's hiding her neck for these really... These are fucking big. They're huge appliances. You know, but then again, they would be, you know, you've got his fangs going in there and suck, 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 suck. And uh, remind me never to do that on camera again. Um, <laughs> and obviously they're being pushed to the oozy infected wounds now. So she's got these and she's trying to hide them. And uh, yeah, I, I stayed here last night. Oh, blah, something like that. Anyway, uh, do you have a good time in Maria? Oh, yeah, 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 blah, blah, blah. Anyway, now the priest has arrived. Dracula's servant and uh, he's asking for a room now here's, this is a curious moment again you've got Max Michael Ripper brilliant he's behind the boy cleaning glasses and the priest comes in um, I want a room for a few days and like he says straight to me no no there's no rooms here and uh, and you can, she knows that he, he's the one that led her to Dracula so she's kind of nervous of him but also she's not going to spill the beans either and then, but she, even though she's quite quietly dreading this guy, she says, oh, we have got a room, yeah, the, the one by Paul. And like, Michael Ripper's going like, uh, shut up, Zena, don't want a priest stay here, what's up with you? You know, like, hey, uh, yes, father, we have, but uh, yeah. Oh, oh, don't worry, it'll only be for a few days, I'll I'll gladly pay, you know, all this thing. Like, all right, well, um, Zena, are you going to show him to his, to his room? And she's like, she won't do it. But Paul has walked in, he goes, oh, I'll, I'll show the father to his room. Uh, what, what kind of business are, what, what are you doing in Kleinenberg anyway, Father? We've got a Monsignor here. And he goes, the Monsignor, yes. Yeah. I, I, I know his daughter. And he's going, daughter. What's, what are you doing in Kleinenberg anyway? Uh, church business. <laughs> church business. So he's now ensconced in uh, the Cafe Johan. And he's got Dracula next door, in the next door basement. Don't know how he fucking did that, but he's done it anyway. And uh, so he's basically going to say to Dracula, look, you know, I know where the I know where the Monsignor lives, and he's got a daughter. So Dracula's like, hey, 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 hey. my vengeance will be complete. In the meantime, bring that other girl down to me now. And it, well, this doesn't develop too well naturally. Uh, the whole thing with uh, Zena, you really think that she's going to make a great vampiress. Along the lines of Barbara Shelley and who was the one in the original, I can't remember her name now, but she was great anyway. Um, I think she's going to be one of these because she's a great character and she d delivers her lines well. She looks ravishing and you will see it with fangs. She will sprout nascent fangs, but sadly, nothing's going to come of this because Dracula will go and put the bite on Maria. And Maria will be sort of drained partially of blood. She will fall under his spell. She will continually open her bedroom windows, well, French windows, and Dracula will be there and he will come. Well, he just teleports, doesn't he? But we do see him walking across the rooftops. Just, you see him go around one rooftop and then he appears somewhere else by a chimney breast or something like that, chimney pot. And uh, he, as I said before, you know, he could turn into a bat, make things a whole lot easier, but doesn't do it. Um, so he is putting the bite on Maria and but Barbara Ewing's character Xena will why did you want her what do you want with her and she will actually lure because you bring the bring the girl to me so you've got this almost pantomime sequence where she's coming to meet Paul in the cafe Yohan, which is packed out Michael Ripper's serving ale and he's dancing and laughing and joking and he's chatting up ladies as well oh no stopping old Michael Ripper and um, Paul's going, uh, Maria's coming to see me, so you know, someone let me know when she's here. Anyway, Maria turns up, but Zena um, intercepts her. Oh, Paul's down in the basement. Just, just, just come down. What's he doing in the basement? No, oh, come, come down here. Come, come, come down here. She puts a Hessian sack over Maria's head. 
fucking throws it in. And of course, like, Dracula's down there waiting for it. And he, he's like, gonna put another bite on it. But Paul starts shouting, Maria, isn't it a song? Maria. Didn't Debbie Harry sing a song about Maria as well? you have gotta see her. Um, and it disturbs it. So he finds her, Paul, someone threw a bag over me and threw me in here and all this. Like, Dracula goes mad about um, uh, about this, not, not getting the bite on her again. And he goes mad at Xena. And she's like, anyway, what do you want with her? You've got me. And, and you think, she's, she, yeah, what do you want with her? You've got me. Look at these, you know. For God's sake, I'm sexy. I wear stockings and all sorts. She's all virginal and dead sweet and demure and polite. Look at me, I'm sexy. Anyway, no. He, he has her killed. The, the bloody priest shovels her into a bloody furnace and burns her. Just when she turns around, lying unconscious on the floor, she turns around, sort of wakens up with a smile, and she's got the fangs, and she's bathed in this sort of orangey red, sort of filtered gel. But no, gets fucking shoveled into this bloody furnace. Whoosh, cookity cook. You know, that she'll be in the next. Those Transylvanian burritos will have a distinct Xena flavour. Ah, oh, you know, why'd you do that? But anyway, right. Dracula has somehow does get another bite on Maria. And this in her, in her bedroom. Now, Maria will have two wounds. Remember that doll I mentioned? Now, this Freddie Francis uh, has got a few little symbols going on here, a bit of symbolism. Whether they're successful or not, is you be the judge. After a night of passion with Paul, she goes back and hugs the little innocent uh, doll. But when Dracula goes in, and Dracula, and she, she undoes, you know, all this, and does her top sort of thing, you don't see nothing. And um, there's no crucifix waiting there either. And she lies on the bed, and Dracula gets there on top of her. And uh, he begins to nuzzle something chronic, really nuzzling on you. You can't, you're looking at this side of her face, he's on. He's busy working on the other side, and then finally, you know, his eyes, and all that, put the bite on. And she's got hold of the doll, but when he puts the bite on, she, she has an orgasmic sort of writhing, and then lets go of the doll, doll hits the floor. Symbolism, folks. After sex with Paul, the doll meant something. It's still sweet after, well, it's not sex with Dracula, is it? It isn't. And this is the other thing about the stupidity of these movies, really. Dracula, what does he get out of all this? Putting, you know, putting the moves on these women, having them under his spell. All he gets is just a bit of blood. That, that's it. it. It really doesn't go anywhere, you know. But anyway, so, but with him, innocence has been destroyed. She is now the devil's concubine, you know. And the, the doll hits the floor. It's clever. But of course, the Monsignor will spot this. Ernst! Ernst! What's wrong with Maria? <laughs> and uh, you find these bites. So he starts reading up. Uh, oh, shouldn't you see a doctor? Uh, maybe tomorrow, but I just want to do some reading up first. So our Monsignor now is reading. All, st all Latin stuff. Charms, uh, herbs, and how to vanquish vampires, and exorcisms, and rites of mass, and all that kind of stuff. So he's preparing himself for the battle with Dracula. Mm. And my tea's gone cold again. Damn it. Um, so, what did he do? He gets, he says, right, look, we need to get Paul here. Paul, but Paul's an atheist. Yes, but she loves him and he loves her. Hang on a minute. Hang on a minute. I have forgotten something. Dracula does try and get there again. And the Monsignor interfe interferes, distracts him. And Dracula smashes out of the um, the window and goes across the rooftops. The Monsignor pursues him. This is a great sequence, this. Uh, and they're going across the roofs and all. Don't go thinking James Bond from, uh, oh God, Quantum of Solace and that big chase across the, the, the tiled rooftops in, uh, in Italy or whatever the hell it was like. Um, don't think quite those sort of stunts. There is stunt work here. The great Eddie Powell is the stuntman for everybody in this movie. And, uh, but as the, as the Monsignor is catching up with Dracula, he turns a corner and then suddenly you see a shadow there. It's not Dracula because the, the Monsignor just goes, you, it's the bloody priest with a great big clay flower pot or chimney pot. Fuck off, boosh, ugh. 
Another bloodied fart. Oh, the priest is lying there. Dracula uh, gets away with it again, and, uh, and the, the priest buggers off as well. The Monsignor manages to stagger across the rooftops back to uh, their place. The mother is there, Anna, Anna is there with their daughter. Uh, and then the priest comes back, Ernst! Oh, he's like, ah, oh, climbing over the uh, the balcony. <laughs> you get him in. Ernst, look, we must get you a doctor. No, there's no time for that. Get get Paul here. Ernst, that speech about like Paul loves her and all this. So they get Paul, but Paul brings the bloody priest, doesn't he? In the meantime, they've learned how to sort of, you know, pr protect Maria from the advances of a vampire. But as Paul turns up with the priest, the Monsignor is like lying there. He's like, I just I haven't got much time. I'm going to teach him everything. And he's already told Paul that Dracula exists. Go and get your things. Come back here because you must stay and watch guard over it tonight. Throughout all the hours of darkness, don't leave her side. for what Not for one second. Like, I'll, I'll go and get your things. Be quick. Be quick. But he, co he comes back with the priest. So uh, Ernst Monsignor um, just goes, and he sees the priest and goes, uh, 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 and conks it. Oh, God. So he couldn't even, he didn't have time to say, you can't trust him. And the priest, the priest is great, by the way. And he's like, you can, see, he's, you can see he's conflicted with all this. He doesn't want anyone to die. He doesn't want to do this, but he can't help himself. He's under the spell of Dracula. Anyway, they read up. They study, you know, Vampirism 101. And Maria's there in bed. And like they must put like flowers of garlic, a hand's width from her, her throat, either side, and put uh, garlic syrup or something. Garlic sauce. I don't know. Smear it all over it. Just dunk it in garlic, you know. Put the crucifix on and all that. Like Anyway, right. Father, you go and have some rest. No, no, no. I'll be fine. Right, okay. and, and they block all the entrances as well with, with cloves of garlic as well, you know, for his egress, you know, into the, into the air, uh, the bedroom. And they've boarded up very quickly. They, they've put boards across because Dracula leapt through the French windows like the night before. So they've blocked all that off. And in, this is the, the most shocking, savage moment in the entire movie. And boy, does it hurt. You've got, he says to the priest, you know, have a, have a break, have a Kit Kat, you know. And uh, the priest goes, no, no, I'll be fine. And like, well, and uh, Barry Andrews as Paul sort of leans beside Maria's bed and he's like that with his big curly mop top. But you've seen the priest pick up a huge like silver candlestick off the the, the chest of drawers, the dressing table, and in a in one take he just goes, boof! Oh my god! It's I defy you not to go. Oh, when he hits him, that looks like although he's got a big mop of hair, so. The candle, the base of the candlestick looks like it's gone into his head, but it's just the, the hair. But with the, the sickening thud, you just think, oh Jesus, that's, that's smashed his brains everywhere. No, it hasn't. But just knocked him out for about a minute or so. Because then you see he starts removing all the garlic and all that. And Dracula obviously wants to take, take the cross away and all that crucifix. And you see, he's like that. He, he's leaning down for the, uh, his fingers come into the other frame to take the, the cross from her neck. He's like, I, I, I can't, I can't do it. And then Paul's woken up. What the hell are you doing? No, it's not my fault. It's, it's him. It's him. It's, it's, it's in my mind. He's making me do this. Right. Well, now you're gonna work for me. Do you understand? You're gonna work for me, for me. I want you to do two things. Two things. First thing, tell me where he is. Tell me where he is. Second thing, take me there. Why don't you just eliminate the first thing and just take me there? <laughs> just, just, just take me. Just take me to where he is. <laughs> God. So they do. Hey, but you need a stake. You've got to take a stake and drag it through his heart. Right. Okay, we're going to do this. So in a great sequence as well, they break into the uh, the other dungeon where Dracula's coffin, the Giselle coffin is. Dracula's in there. Whew, they open that like, All right, you've got to strike now. Do it now. And Paul, like, uh, Paul's kind of like, okay, okay. And he's not got a hammer, so he's just got a great big wooden stake. He's just drive it through his heart now. And he's like, do it now. All right, all right, like, and it's quite a gory staking as well. And Jack is like, <laughs> and blood wells up, you know, and it's going everywhere. And as he's holding it like that, there's blood gushing all over the show. Like, now you must, you must say a prayer. You must say a prayer. What? I've got to say a prayer. 
I'm, a, I'm an atheist, remember? I'm just killing a vampire as far as I can say, and that job done. He didn't mention anything about praying. Doesn't mean nothing to me. And he's like, but you must pray. See, this is it. Since when do you have to say a prayer when you stake a vampire? I know some people do in some of the movies, but you don't. Have, it's not written down that you've got to do that. Anyway, but so he can't say a prayer, so Dracula whoop, gets up out of the coffin, <laughs> takes it out. Christopher Lee hated this. He said, we've broken all the laws here. You know, you, you cannot, you, if I've been staked, I cannot remove the stake. You know, that's, why, what's the point of arguing? What difference does it make? He'll be back in the next movie anyway. So, takes it out, and they're like, oh my God, and he throws the stake. Now, I would have loved, like, the priest to have been staked by that. But no, he just misses the two of them. Paul lengths it out, opens that bloody uh, furnace, gets the big shovel in there, just Dracula comes up, he fucking hells, you know, flaming coals on him. But Dracula turns that multi-purpose cape around, which is fireproof, like that. And then, a <laughs> great shot, like, Paul goes back to another shovelful, and then turns around and just throws his hot coals, but Dracula's not there. So he goes, looks that way, Dracula's already got going out the doorway. <laughs> And he's heading for Maria. And Maria has awoken and is under the thrall. Dracula's up on the roofs. Maria's on the roofs. He will get to her. Uh, I keep saying Barry Humphreys. Barry Andrews. Barry, imagine Barry Humphreys in this. Like, Dracula? That's a little, a little bit spooky, darlings. Please, if you have editing devices, please take that last 10 seconds out of this video. It's what I should do. I'll never, never do a Barry Humphreys, Dave Ender Average impersonation ever again, I swear to God. Anyway, so Paul will catch up with Dracula, but Dracula gets him with one-handed throttle, like that, picks him up, throws him, and he tumbles down the roof, hits another chimney, and he's there. It's all these, these matte paintings. By the way, the matte paintings are done by a guy called, oh, where is it now? Peter Melrose, and a lot of them are done on glass. Like the mountainsides and castles and the hill, the, the, the skies, they're done on glass and they, they look gorgeous. But these downward shots and across the um, the panorama of Kleinenberg, all these rooftops, it's, it's wonderfully done. Real sense of scale, very evocative, but they're, I mean, they're not realistic, but that doesn't really matter. Anyway, Dracula with the priest now has, they've got the hearse and they've got the priest in the back of the hearse and he and Veronica Carlson, barefoot, just in their nighty riding through um, Black Park and Box Hill. And he, he's fucking, Dracula's whipping these horses. Whoosh, 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 whoosh. He's really going for it. Like, like in the film Scars of Dracula, where he whips the arse off um, poor Patrick Trout and his clove, his, uh, his, his unfortunate manservant. Whoosh, whoosh, and they're getting back to the castle. So now, <laughs> uh, Paul, legs it gets a horse and he's like and he's and it's really uh barry andrews thundering through these little crossroads through black park and all that hurtling through the forest and he gets to the town and he seems to get to the town ahead of dracula and uh you know and the priest and maria and he goes into that first tavern we mentioned the one with george cooper as a landlord and he goes in there and he, he he's another one that says that the castle here could someone show you where the castle is which is meant to be on the mountain right there, whose shadow touches the church, which is just there. So you should be able to look up and see it, you know, but you can't. It's hidden by polystyrene and glass matte paintings. And uh, so George Gibbs going, no, that's Castle Dracula. You don't want to go up there. None of us go up there, but I have to go up there. Look, look, it's all over. We don't need any more trouble now. Just don't, don't bring any trouble to our door. But he's back, Dracula's back, Dracula's dead, everyone says. Like the slaughtered lamb all over again, all heads have turned and all this. And then, um, anyway, big, won't anyone help me? What, is no one brave enough? He, he's back here and, and they hear the carriage, the hearse of Dracula thundering past. So George Cooper, the landlord, just puts one of those little flimsy sort of, you know, barricades whoosh, on the uh, on the door. You know, Why won't you people leave us alone? Whenever you come here, you bring trouble and all this. And they like, restrain him. We'll, take, we'll lock him up in one of the bedrooms for now until morning and cool off. So a bit of fisty cuffs and he's hailing people over. Won't anyone show me? Cue that little, um, well, it's not so little actually, that bell ringer from the, the mute bell ringer. And he'd be thinking like, what the, f the fuck do you want? What? <laughs> oh, get him a pint, someone. Oh, you want to show me a dragon? Oh, okay, right. 
So they managed to make their getaway. And in the meantime, Dracula has parked up by the trees and he and Veronica Carlson, barefoot, her feet all ripped up, walking over tree roots and rocks and stones and, you know, what have you, make their way to the Palestinian rocks and head up to the battlements of Castle Dracula. The priest crawls at the back of the hearse and he's, well, they just leave him there. Although he will contrive to end up there as well. But you don't see, they don't go with him or he doesn't go with them. In the meantime, like Dracula says like to Maria, remove that thing now, throw it away. So how heavy is this thing meant to be? I mean, the Monsignor had it on his back. It's clearly just made out of plywood and just painted gold. And she takes it off like that. And he's like, throw it, throw it away. So, and he's already thrown it to the ground as well. A grateful bastard, he really is. And she throws it over the air, the battlements. And then Paul suddenly, sorry, we see it cascade ching, 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 down the air, the Polistani rocks, where it lands with a very sort of almost animated comical thud, sticking point upwards. Hmm, what's going to happen there? Hmm, I wonder. Dracula, you should know. You, it happens to you. Almost every movie you're in, this happens to you. You should spot these things a mile away. So anyway, Paul gets up there. Maria! And I'm like, ah, he hasn't even got in his house yet. He still can't get into his house. All I wanted to do was go and have a drink in my own dining room. You know, go to sleep in my own bed. For God's sake, that's all I wanted for 200 years. You bastards keep denying me this. I get no peace, you know. He doesn't even get to open the door. And like, Paul pounces on him. The two of them have a big tussle. A tussle that lasts about three seconds, actually. It's very lacklustre. And they, they're, they're sort of on the balcony, you know, on the on the battlement, the stone battlement. And he's trying to force Paul over, but Paul somehow gets the upper hand. And next thing, poor old Chris of Levis goes, hoo, hoo! <laughs> gets pitched over, rolls down the Polistari rocks, crunch. <laughs> and he's there, ah, oh, it's in his back, it's come out his chest. Oh no. And he's like, he's writhing around, and you can just see. He tracked it just going, oh, not again. Oh, fucking hell. I've just, I've just got started. You know, Jesus Christ. Why me? Why me? And he's writhing round. In reality, when they were filming this sequence, um, Hammer Films were being awarded uh, an award, a Queen's Award for uh, something for the film industry. The Queen's Award for contribution to the film industry. And the... Uh, the Lord Lieutenant of so and so place and his wife, his, all his braid and his, you know, his medals and regalia, was there to give the award to Hammer. But he, he arrived in time to watch this death scene of Dracula, and Chris Lee just goes, you know, oh my God, he's writhing round. He's got the uh, the red contact lens. He's he's weeping tears of blood as well, and he's like, oh, oh, he's getting it in this sort of hollow as well, and he. It's not the best, is it? You know, best way to be seen by sort of hierarchy and being as aristocratic as Christopher Lee genuinely was. And he said as well, like, that, uh, you know, I, I just looked at this couple who were thinking, what the hell are we looking at? And uh, the wife apparently said, you know, what, what, what are they doing to that poor man? And the Lord Lieutenant said, uh, that man there uh, is a member of my club. <laughs> but um, anyway, the priest has gone up there as well. And he manages to say you know, an exorcism as Dracula's writhing away to his heart's content. And uh, and Dracula just goes, uh, it gets these tears of blood. Uh, and a big close-up, uh, like that. And um, the full moon is up there, clouds are, well, I would say the clouds are passing in front of it, but they're not, it's a, it's a, it's a frozen stock shot. <laughs> so the clouds aren't moving at all. And uh, Dracula just begins to wither and decompose. And yeah, you've seen it all before. Just the cape is left there with blood trickling on the floor. The priest uh, 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 finally dies. Well, we assume he dies. It looks like he dies. But he definitely collapses after all the exertions. And right, the evil's left him now, but hits the, hits the polystyrene. And he's, for the second time, actually, and he's gone. He's out the picture, out the frame. So our two lovebirds are there. And uh, happy days are here again until obviously Taste the Blood of Dracula and uh, Ralph Bates will, re will use Dracula's ashes and will bring him back, oh Christ, to Taste the Blood of Dracula. 
Uh, folks, I may have, may have made this film sound really daft and ridiculous and rather inept. And it is. <laughs> it all, it's all of those. But it's also wonderful. It's beautifully atmospheric. It moves along at a hell of a clip. Despite, there's no real body counts. Who have we got? Well, Dracula, obviously. Uh, Xena and the priest. Oh, and the Monsignor. Sorry, Monsignor dies. But that's it. So there's no there's no rising body count. Um, but there is plenty of rooftop action, lots of chases, lots of thundering through the woods. James Bernard's histrionic score. James Bernard, regular uh, movie composer for Hammer. And of course came up with the famous dun 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 Dracula theme. Dracula. Which this film doesn't have. No. He says he doesn't like the, uh, he didn't really enjoy this score. And what, what he does in this score, it's uh, although it's got all the appropriate uh, brass and like bombast and shrill elements of terror and suspense, but it has a sort of a reworking of the Dies Irae, the Day of Wrath, you know, the, uh, the old Gregorian chant and uh, mass, Catholic mass, which I've discussed a lot, and it's in a lot of movies, of course. But his main theme for this is the Dies Irae, just slightly reworked, and it's beautiful. I think it's a great score. Um, the leads uh, do equip themselves really well. I mean, even though Marie is a bit, a bit of a thankless sort of role, but Carlson, Veronica Carlson, is actually really good. I love this the scene where, at the dinner table, where, you know, well, what church did you go to? Oh, I'm an atheist, sir. You know, like, what? And like, he just see, he just cuts to Veronica Carlson, and she just goes, uh, it was all going so well. He's made a good impression on um, on me mum, and and even my uncle seems to like him. You know, because he's been honest. But just don't be too honest. He does say to her afterwards, like, why did you have to tell him that? Because I always tell the truth. I always tell the truth. I can't help it. You know, it, it's a fault of mine. I tell the truth. Uh, so folks, don't always tell the truth. You know, and uh, and Barry Andrews, who I said before, I wish he'd gone on to much more things. Uh, but he, he just didn't. Um, Blood on Satan's Claw and a few TV shows, and that's pretty much it, to be honest. Although he is in, I think he's in The Spy Love Me as well. Mm, there you go, playing a naval officer. I think, I think so. Can't quite remember now. But uh, there's actually a lot cut out of this movie. Not only was the, uh, the the guy who plays the priest, Ewan Hooper, not available to go in and redub his voice, so he brought someone else in. Um, at, when the, the film wrapped, Freddie Francis, the director, Went off on holiday. Oh, bad timing, mate, because behind your back, Anthony Hines and the editor who is, let me just see, who edited this? Spencer Reeve um, went in and cut out a fair bit of the love story between um, Maria and Paul. I, mean, I kind of wonder what the love story was because you've got enough of that there. I don't know what these scenes were, but very Francis says, I came back and they, they removed half of the love story. So, we have your back. So I wasn't even consulted about this. So he was really disillusioned and disappointed that they've done that. But I do does beg a you know belief as to what exactly had they filmed extra to you know endorse this undying love. You get that from what you see in the movie really really well. The sets are great. Uh, the the pub in the little village in, in the in the in the shadow of Castle Dracula. Is, uh, is wonderful, or team, timber structures and beams. Love it, love the way Hammer do these, these pubs and taverns. Uh, the Cafe Johan is great. Uh, the, the two cellars are wonderful. Dracula's one with all its sepulchral lighting and uh, the little drip, drip, drip going on. And the lovely sort of fairness and bakery, oh, all these breads and meats and stuff. Oh, it's wonderful, I love all that. The rooftops, the glass paintings, the, uh, the matte shots, Truly evocative. The use of um, Black Park and Box Hill, fabulous. Even the polystyrene rocks I keep going on about. I, I actually like them. You, you want to go scampering up them. There's some great shots of the Monsignor at the start of the movie with the, the cross on his back, going up these, you know, get, getting further out of the, the, the wooded area into the rocky canyons and the ravines and the mountainside, even though it's just quite clearly all of about 20 foot squared of polystyrene and shrubs. But it looks great, you know, I like it. 
But you've got, you know, the, the, the stupid elements of like, oh, how come the priest happens to fall right there and trip blood right into Dracula's mouth, awakening Dracula. Dracula doesn't do much. He actually does more than in some of the movies. Doesn't do a great deal in uh, Dracula Prince of Darkness, to be perfectly honest. Doesn't do a great deal in any of the subsequent movies after this. But at least in this, he, oh, whoosh, whoosh, he's fighting, he's, he's smashing through uh, French windows. He's throwing a stake at people. He's uh, scampering across rooftops and all that. So, you know, there is a fair bit of action that Christopher Lee gets to do. And he gets more dialogue than in, obviously, any of the other movies after this. And uh, and he said he liked the fact he had more to say. But what, what he has to say isn't, isn't much. You know, who did that? Throw that away! You know, now, now my revenge is complete. He says, when it quite clearly isn't, you know. I mean, what's his plan with? He's taking Maria back to the back to the church. Here's something for you, you know. Right at the start, well, when Dracula's been reawoken and the Monsignor's done one, and we cut back, who did this? Why doesn't he get the priest to take it off the castle doors? Have I missed something there? He's got the this errant priest in his thrall. You watch my lips. You. Take that big cross off there and throw over side down mountain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Why does it? Why does he get him to do that? And then, oh, and by the way, now we'll go in. We'll have a rest. We'll have some. We'll have some supper, and then uh, we'll discuss battle plans. Yes, I still want my revenge, the Monsignor. But at least I've got my castle back. Well, of course, the reason is that the budget didn't stretch to show in the inside of the castle, uh, and this big edifice, which is forever, it's sort of like the angle you're looking at. It sort of it just goes up to a big point, big. Imp impending doom, this blackened gothic structure. I like it, uh, but you you would kill to see inside that again, just to get inside Castle Dracula, but it's not to be. But there's also Cl Kleinenberg. Uh, you get like a long shot of Kleinenberg. So it's a real town, probably in Serbia or somewhere. They've got like a shot of this town. And it's, it's quite a big suburb, you know, it's quite a lengthy, um, highly, populated area in the lee of these glass painted mountains and all that but it does look really good so you, you do get a sense of scale so when you're actually there and you, you see uh, Maria and Paul running through the cobbled streets uh, and laughing and joking going around stone columns and down other passageways you do get a sense of this is a big big bustling town um, and especially from the rooftops you get that all as well so it does add a sense of um, gothic scale and grandeur to it which I love um, just trying to think, where, where, where else can we go with this? Freddie Francis would obviously go on to um, a lot more movies. He would turn his back on horror. He he, he said, I sat down with uh, having lunch with Christopher Lee. I'm making this movie. And he's, and Christopher Lee said, like, uh, I'm really getting sick of making these movies. I wish I could get out of them, but I just can't. And he said, that summed up exactly how I felt. I was getting sick of doing the same old stuff all the time. And these scripts, I wanted to go on to bigger things, bigger movies, which of course he would do. Not so much directing them, but certainly, you know, providing the, uh, the exquisite cinematography. You imagine Scorsese's Cape Fear without that ravishing photography. It'd be a completely different movie. Um, what else have we got? Uh, Church Business, The Transylvanian Burritos, The Spiral Staircase and Hairy Armpits. <laughs> uh, no? I think, folks, I've actually covered that quite extensively. We've been listening to the score all the way through. As I say, James Bernard wasn't happy with it. I think it's great. It's it's not quite as bombastic and as shrill and as full of like you know, dun, 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 elements, but it has got creeping suspense and this darkness to it. I wish Xena was in it more. Uh, I wish Barbara Ewing had gone on to do more movies with Hammer. Um, I don't think she did, um, which is a shame, but she's tremendous in this. Uh, and you do wish you'd see more of it. And, uh, when you see it with the uh, the fangs in that sort of that red and orange gel covering on the on the, the camera, you think, oh, this could really, oh no, because wouldn't it have been great if she like I really want to, I fancy my, uh, not Max, that's Michael Ripper. <laughs> that would have been great though, wouldn't it? Oh, I fancy Paul. Now I now I can take it. Maria doesn't stand a chance because I'm going to send her to Dracula while I go for Paul. But no, because she's. Dracula somehow believes that Xena's at fault for like 
not giving Maria to him. How did she? Paul was due there anyway. So the whole thing was going to go tits up, wasn't it? But in his... Oh, he's, he's, he's no pleasing some vampires, isn't it? But Dragon is going, oh, in a fit of rage, right, I'll kill her, you know. So, and, and she's out, out the picture then. Just, the, the plot could have took a different turn there. A lot of the complaints about this movie are that it doesn't have much of a plot. Seriously. Seriously? After Dracula, the first one, horror of Dracula for you Americans, uh, and Dracula, Prince of Darkness, we don't get any plots. He, he's awoken, he does something. Look at Scars of Dracula. Uh, you know, you've, you've, you've got two brothers, one, one of which is Dennis Waterman, um, and you've got Jenny Hanley from Magpie, who was also in uh, Blood from the... No, hang on. Oh, God, what's it called? Blood on Satan's Claw. Oh, God. Uh, she's also in that. And um, with Barry Andrews. But with Scars of Dracula, you've, you've just got you've got a lot of stuff in Castle Dracula taking place, which is nice. Complete contrast to this movie, obviously. And you've got pa poor Patrick Troughton there, and you've got quite a bit of blood and gore as well. And Dracula even eat, licking, supping blood from it, the wounds, you know, and bloodied sheets and a, you know the victim. But uh, and a, a guy, one of the brothers is impaled on a spike and all that. But you've got couples contriving to end up at Castle Dracula, which is, again, it's exactly what the, the plot of uh, Dracula Prince of Darkness is as well. And it's, But at least in Scars of Dracula, you do get him crawling down near the castle walls as well, like in Stoker's book. And like, you very rarely see it in any movie adaptation. And Christopher Lee was made up to, to actually do it, although it doesn't look quite as effective because the budget wasn't great for it. So you, you get a, it's only a very cramped sort of shot. But either way, he attempted it at least. But plot-wise, Okay, look at Dracula 80, 1972. He's awoken for a night and then he's vanquished again in Chelsea, swinging Chelsea of 1972, you know. And then you've got Satanic Rites of Dracula where he's setting up bubonic plague on the world. There's secret agents, there's uh, government officials, there's motorcycle uh, assassins. What? It's not a story. It's still not a story. You're not doing anything with Dracula that hasn't been done before. Apart from, oh yeah, I want to unleash a plague on the world really what else are you actually going to do in the movie uh, nothing but you know but there's, there's still the thing about hammer movies is there's always an undeniable quality to them which makes you keep on going back you you see the shortcomings you see the shortfalls you see the limitations and restrictions of a low budget and you see that there's the stock house style which is in there but once you embrace that you look forward to it you love these things and they get by on the sheer quality of mostly the acting and the atmosphere that they evoke and the musical scores and just seeing you know these same faces popping up in the same sort of environment so oh, it's michael ripper again yay you know it's a it, pub landlord it's a, you know a tavern keeper grave digger you know what whatever but and dracula just just standing there with different lighting on him looking menacing but doing absolutely fuck all for most of it and another bunch of like thrown together, hapless, you know, characters who pledge their love and must vanquish this Dracula character. And, you know, why anyone's afraid of Dracula? Because everyone seems to be able to kill him, you know. He's, in a, he's unlucky, sod. Now, throw it away! Why don't you think? It's, it's going to go dum 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 You know. And then he ends up on it again. You've got to laugh every time. He just, it's the look on his face, it's like, oh, shit! Not again! Why? Why? You know, I haven't even done anything yet. You know, I've only been awake for a day. And, and I sleep during the day as well. So, oh God. No, you've got to feel sorry for Dracula. I can't even say, I've said Dracula that much. It sounds funny me saying it. Dracula. Dracula. He's very jocular, is Dracula. And he always goes with the jugular, does Dracula. Right, folks. I want a proper cup of tea. And maybe smoke a cigar, you know. Folks, I have been always killed, man. Please, in the meantime, in this ever gothic in between time, please keep it Celtic, keep it Celtic. And I am going to see you all. <laughs> Unless I stumble over the battlements again and end up impaling myself again. But there's always a passing priest to read some kind of exorcism or funeral rite over me. And then he sprinkled whiskey over my ashes. And bingo! 
I have been resurrected again. So folks, I will do a, a video on the mutations as well. Cheers to Cristiano for that. And I'm gonna see you all in the flap of a bat wing.